Magna Carta The Magna Carta was signed on June 12, 15 between the barons of medieval England and King John. Magna Carta is Latin and means Great Charter. The Magna Carta was one of the most important documents of medieval England. It was signed, by royal seal, between the barons and John at Runnymede near Windsor Castle. The document was a series of written promises between the king and his subjects that he, the king, would govern England and deal with its people according to the customs of feudal law. Magna Carta was an attempt by the barons to stop the king in this case John abusing his power with the people of England suffering. The Magna Carta of 1215 Why would a king who was meant to be all-powerful in his own country agree to the demands of the barons who were meant to be below him in authority? England had for some years owned land in France. The barons had provided the king with both money and men to defend this territory. Traditionally, the king had always consulted the barons before raising taxes, as they had to collect it, and demanding more men for military service, as they had to provide the men. This was all part of the feudal system. While kings were militarily successful abroad, relations between the kings and the barons were good. John was not successful in his military campaigns abroad. His constant demands for more money and men angered the barons. By 1204, John had lost his land in northern France. In response to this, John introduced high taxes without asking the barons. This was against feudal law and accepted custom. John made mistakes in other areas as well. He angered the Roman Catholic Church. The Pope, angered by John's behavior, banned all church services in England in 1207. Religion and the fear of hell were very important to the people including the barons. The Catholic Church taught the people that they could only get to heaven if the Catholic Church believed that they were good enough to got there. How could they show their goodness and love of God if the churches were shut? Even worse for John was the fact that the Pope excommunicated him in 1209. This meant that John could never get to heaven until the Pope withdrew the excommunication. Faced with this, John climbed down and accepted the power of the Catholic Church giving them many privileges in 1214. 1214 was a disastrous year for John for another reason. Once again, he suffered military defeat in an attempt to get back his territory in northern France. He returned to London demanding more money from taxes. This time the barons were not willing to listen. They rebelled against his power. The barons captured London. However, they did not defeat John entirely and by the spring of 1215, both sides were willing to discuss matters. The result was the Magna Carta. What did the Magna Carta bring in? All 63 clauses of the document can be found on www.britannia.com slash history slash magnitude.html The document can be divided into sections. The first clause is concern the position of the Catholic Church in England. Those that follow state that John will be less harsh on the barons. Many of the clauses concern England's legal system. Magna Carta promised laws that were good and fair. It states that everyone shall have access to courts and that costs and money should not be an issue if someone wanted to take a problem to the law courts. It also states that no freeman will be imprisoned or punished without first going through the proper legal system. In future years the word freeman was replaced by no one to include everybody. The last few sections deal with how the Magna Carta would be enforced in England. Twenty-five barons were given the responsibility of making sure the king carried out what was stated in the Magna Carta. The document clearly states that they could use force if they felt it was necessary. To give the Magna Carta an impact, the royal seal of King John was put on it to show people that it had his royal support. This is the largest red seal at the bottom of the Magna Carta above. In detail it looked like this. King John's Royal Seal Magna Carta 
the Great Charter of English Liberty granted, under considerable duress, by King John at Runnymede on June 15, 1215. John, by the grace of God King of England, Lord of Ireland, Duke of Normandy and Aquitaine, and Count of Angel, to his archbishops, bishops, abbots, earls, barons, justices, foresters, sheriffs, stewards, servants, and to all his officials and loyal subjects, greeting. Know that before God, for the health of our soul and those of our ancestors and heirs, to the honor of God, the exaltation of the Holy Church, and the better ordering of our kingdom, at the advice of our Reverend Father Stephen, Archbishop of Canterbury, Primate of all England, and Cardinal of the Holy Roman Church, Henry Archbishop of Dublin, William Bishop of London, Peter Bishop of Winchester, Jocelyn Bishop of Bath and Glastonbury, Hugh Bishop of Lincoln, Walter Bishop of Worcester, William Bishop of Coventry, Benedict Bishop of Rochester, Master Pandulf Subdeacon and Member of the Papal Household, Brother A. Merrick Master of the Knights of the Temple in England, William Marshall, Earl of Pembroke, William Earl of Salisbury, William Earl of Warren, William Earl of Arundel, Alan D. Galloway Constable of Scotland, Warren Fitzgerald, Peter Fitzherbert, Hubert E. Bergson Eskel of Poetu, Hugh D. Neville, Matthew Fitzherbert, Thomas Bassett, Alan Bassett, Philip Dalbenny, Robert D. Ropley, John Marshall, John Fitzhugh, and other loyal subjects. 1. First that we have granted to God, and by this present charter have confirmed for us and our heirs in perpetuity, that the English Church shall be free, and shall have its rights undiminished, and its liberties unimpaired. That we wish this so to be observed, appears from the fact that of our own free will, before the outbreak of the present dispute between us and our barons, we granted and confirmed by charter the freedom of the Church's elections a right reckoned to be of the greatest necessity and importance to it and caused this to be confirmed by Pope Innocent III. This freedom we shall observe ourselves and desire to be observed in good faith by our heirs in perpetuity. We have also granted to all free men of our realm, for us and our heirs forever, all the liberties written out below, to have and to keep for them and their heirs of us and our heirs. 2. If any earl, baron, or other person that holds lands directly of the crown, for military service, shall die, and at his death his heir shall be of full age and owe relief, the heir shall have his inheritance on payment of the ancient scale of relief. That is to say, the heir or heirs of an earl shall pay for the entire earl's barony, the heir or heirs of a knight L0s. At most for the entire knight's fee, and any man that owes less shall pay less, in accordance with the ancient usage of fees. 3. But if the heir of such a person is under age and award, when he comes of age he shall have his inheritance without relief or fine. 4. The guardian of the land of an heir who is under age shall take from it only reasonable revenues, customary dues, and feudal services. He shall do this without destruction or damage to men or property. If we have given the guardianship of the land to a sheriff, or to any person answerable to us for the revenues, and he commits destruction or damage, we will exact compensation from him, and the land shall be entrusted to two worthy and prudent men of the same fee, who shall be answerable to us for the revenues, or to the person to whom we have assigned them. If we have given or sold to anyone the guardianship of such land, and he causes destruction or damage, he shall lose the guardianship of it, and it shall be handed over to two worthy and prudent men of the same fee, who shall be similarly answerable to us. 5. For so long as a guardian has guardianship of such land, he shall maintain the houses, parks, fish preserves, ponds, mills, and everything else pertaining to it from the revenues of the land itself. When the heir comes of age, he shall restore the whole land to him, stocked with plough teams and such implements of husbandry as the season demands and the revenues from the land can reasonably bear. 6. Heirs may be given in marriage, but not to someone of lower social standing. Before marriage takes place, it shall be made known to the heirs next of kin. 7. At her husband's death, a widow may have her marriage portion and inheritance at once and without trouble. She shall pay nothing for her dower, 
marriage portion, or any inheritance that she and her husband held jointly on the day of his death. She may remain in her husband's house for forty days after his death, and within this period her dower shall be assigned to her. 8. No widow shall be compelled to marry, so long as she wishes to remain without a husband. But she must give security that she will not marry without royal consent, if she holds her lands of the crown, or without the consent of whatever other lord she may hold them of. 9. Neither we nor our officials will seize any land or rent in payment of a debt, so long as the debtor has movable goods sufficient to discharge the debt. A debtor's sureties shall not be distrained upon so long as the debtor himself can discharge his debt. If, for lack of means, the debtor is unable to discharge his debt, his sureties shall be answerable for it. If they so desire, they may have the debtor's lands and rents until they have received satisfaction for the debt that they paid for him, unless the debtor can show that he has settled his obligations to them. 10. If anyone who has borrowed a sum of money from Jews dies before the debt has been repaid, his heir shall pay no interest on the debt for so long as he remains under age, irrespective of whom he holds his lands. If such a debt falls into the hands of the crown, it will take nothing except the principal sum specified in the bond. 11. If a man dies owing money to Jews, his wife may have her dare and pay nothing towards the debt from it. If he leaves children that are under age, their needs may also be provided for on a scale appropriate to the size of his holding of lands. The debt is to be paid out of the residue, reserving the service due to his feudal lords. Debts owed to persons other than Jews are to be dealt with similarly. 12. No scottage or aid may be levied in our kingdom without its general consent, unless it is for the ransom of our person, to make our eldest son a knight, and, once, to marry our eldest daughter. For these purposes only a reasonable aid may be levied. Aids from the City of London are to be treated similarly. 13. The City of London shall enjoy all its ancient liberties and free customs, both by land and by water. We also will and grant that all other cities, boroughs, towns, and ports shall enjoy all their liberties and free customs. 14. To obtain the general consent of the realm for the assessment of an aid except in the three cases specified above or a scottage, we will cause the archbishops, bishops, abbots, earls, and greater barons to be summoned individually by letter. To those who hold lands directly of us we will cause a general summons to be issued, through the sheriffs and other officials, to come together on a fixed day, of which at least forty days' notice shall be given, and at a fixed place. In all letters of summons, the cause of the summons will be stated. When a summons has been issued, the business appointed for the day shall go forward in accordance with the resolution of those present even if not all those who were summoned have appeared. 15. In future we will allow no one to levy an aid from his free men, except to ransom his person, to make his eldest son a knight, and, once, to marry his eldest daughter. For these purposes only a reasonable aid may be levied. 16. No man shall be forced to perform more service for a knight's fee or other freeholding of land than is due from it. 17. Ordinary lawsuits shall not follow the royal court around, but shall be held in a fixed place. 18. Inquests of novel decision, mort de ancestor, and arraign presentment shall be taken only in their proper county court. We ourselves, or in our absence abroad our Chief Justice, will send two justices to each county four times a year, and these justices, with four knights of the county elected by the county itself, shall hold the assizes in the county court on the day and in the place where the court meets. 19. If any assizes cannot be taken on the day of the county court, as many knights and freeholders shall afterwards remain behind, of those who have attended the court, as will suffice for the administration of justice, having regard to the volume of business to be done. 20. For a trivial offence, a free man shall be fined only in proportion to the degree of his offence, and for a serious offence correspondingly, but not so heavily as to deprive him of his livelihood. In the same way, a merchant shall be spared his merchandise, 
and a husbandman the implements of his husbandry, if they fall upon the mercy of a royal court. None of these fines shall be imposed except by the assessment on oath of reputable men of the neighborhood. 21. Earls and barons shall not be immersed save through their peers, and only according to the measure of the offense. 22. No clerk shall be immersed for his lay tenement except according to the manner of the other persons aforesaid, and not according to the amount of his ecclesiastical benefice. 23. Neither a town nor man shall be forced to make bridges over the rivers, with the exception of those who, from of old and of right ought to do it. 24. No sheriff, constable, coroners, or other bailiffs of ours shall hold the pleas of our crown. 25. All counties, hundreds, wapandakes, and trattings are to men manners being accepted shall continue according to the old farms, without any increase at all. 26. If anyone holding from us a lay fee shall die, and our sheriff or bailiff can show our letters patent containing our summons for the debt which the dead man owed to us, our sheriff or bailiff may be allowed to attach and enroll the chattels of the dead man to the value of that debt, through view of lawful men, in such way, however, that nothing shall be removed thence until the debt is paid which was plainly owed to us, and the residue shall be left to the executors that they may carry out the will of the dead man. And if nothing is owed to us by him, all the chattels shall go to the use prescribed by the deceased, saving their reasonable portions to his wife and children. 27. If any freeman shall have died in estate his chattels shall be distributed through the hands of his near relatives and friends, by view of the church, saving to anyone the debts which the dead man owed him. 28. No constable or other bailiff of ours shall take the corn or other chattels of anyone except he straightway give money for them, or can be allowed a respite in that regard by the will of the seller. 29. No constable shall force any knight to pay money for cast a word if he be willing to perform that ward in person, or he for a reasonable cause not being able to perform it himself through another proper man. And if we shall have led or sent him on a military expedition, he shall be quit of ward according to the amount of time during which, through us, he shall have been in military service. 30. No sheriff nor bailiff of ours, nor anyone else, shall take the horses or carts of any freeman for transport, unless by the will of that freeman. 31. Neither we nor our bailiffs shall take another's wood for castles or for other private uses, unless by the will of him to whom the wood belongs. 32. We shall not hold the lands of those convicted of felony longer than a year and a day, and then the lands shall be restored to the lords of the fiefs. 33. Henceforth all the wares in the Thames and Medway, and throughout all England, save on the sea coast, shall be done away with entirely. 34. Henceforth the writ which is called precipice shall not be to served on anyone for any holding so as to cause a free man to lose his court. 35. There shall be one measure of wine throughout our whole realm, and one measure of ale and one measure of corn namely, the London court, and one width of dyed and russet and halberd cloths namely, two ells below the selvage. And with weights, moreover, it shall be as with measures. 36. Henceforth nothing shall be given or taken for a writ of inquest in a matter concerning life or limb, but it shall be conceded gratis and shall not be denied. 37. If anyone hold of us in fee farm, or in suckage, or in burnicage, and hold land of another by military service, we shall not, by reason of that fee farm, or suckage, or burkage, have the wardship of his heir or of his land which is held in fee from another. Nor shall we have the wardship of that fee farm, or suckage, or burkage unless that fee farm owe military service. We shall not, by reason of some petty surjondy which someone holds of us through the service of giving us knives or arrows or the like, have the wardship of his heir or of the land which he holds of another by military service. 38. No bailiff on his own simple assertion shall henceforth any one to his law, without producing faithful witnesses and evidence. 
39. No freeman shall be taken, or imprisoned, or deceased, or outlawed, or exiled, or in any way harmed, nor will we go upon or send upon him save by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. 40. To none will we sell, to none deny or delay, right or justice. 41. All merchants may safely and securely go out of England, and come into England, and delay and pass through England, as well by land as by water, for the purpose of buying and selling, free from all evil taxes, subject to the ancient and right customs save in time of war, and if they are of the land at war against us, and if such be found in our land at the beginning of the war, they shall be held, without harm to their bodies and goods, until it shall be known to us or our chief justice how the merchants of our land are to be treated who shall, at that time, be found in the land at war against us. And if ours shall be safe there, the others shall be safe in our land. 42. Henceforth any person, saving fealty to us, may go out of our realm and return to it, safely and securely, by land and by water, except perhaps for a brief period in time of war, for the common good of the realm. But prisoners and outlaws are accepted according to the law of the realm, also people of a land at war against us, and the merchants, with regard to whom shall be done as we have said. 43. If anyone hold from any Eshidas from the honor of Wallingford, Nottingham, Boulogne, Lancaster, or the other Eshids which are in our hands and our baronies and shall die, his heir shall not give another relief, nor shall he perform for us other service than he would perform for a baron if the barony were in the hand of a baron, and we shall hold it in the same way in which the baron has held it. 44. Persons dwelling without the forest shall not henceforth come before the forest justices, through common summonses, unless they are impleted or are the sponsors of some person or persons attached for matters concerning the forest. 45. We will not make men justices, constables, sheriffs, or bailiffs unless they are such as know the law of the realm and are minded to observe it rightly. 46. All barons who have founded abbeys for which they have charters of the King of England or ancient right of tenure shall have, as they ought to have, their custody when vacant. 47 or 11 force constituted as such in our time shall stray to a be annulled, and the same shall be done for river banks made into places of defense by us in our time. 48. A 11 evil customs concerning forests and warrens, and concerning foresters and varreners, sheriffs and their servants, river banks and their guardians, shall stray to a be inquired into each county, through twelve sworn knights from that county, and shall be eradicated by them, entirely, so that they shall never be renewed, within forty days after the inquest has been made, in such manner that we shall first know about them, or our justice if we be not in England. 49. We shall straightway return all hostages and charters which were delivered to us by Englishmen as a surety for peace or faithful service. 50. We shall in theory remove from their bailiwicks the relatives of Gerard the Athes, so that they shall henceforth have no bailiwick in England, Engelardicians, and Rupiter and Yindi Chanchelis, Yindi Sins, Geoffrey de Martin and his brothers, Philip Mark and his brothers, and Geoffrey his nephew, and the whole following of them. 51. And straightway after peace is restored we shall remove from the realm all the foreign soldiers, crossbowmen, servants, hurlings, who may have come with horses and arms to the harm of the realm. 52. If anyone shall have been deceased by us, or removed, without a legal sentence of his peers, from his lands, castles, liberties or lawful right, we shall straightway restore them to him. And if a dispute shall arise concerning this matter it shall be settled according to the judgment of the twenty-five barons who were mentioned below as sureties for the peace. But with regard to all those things of which anyone was, by King Henry our father or King Richard our brother, deceased or dispossessed without legal judgment of his peers, which we have in our hand or which others hold, and for which we ought to give a guarantee, we shall have respite unto the common term for crusaders. Except with regard to those concerning which a plea was moved, or an inquest made by our order, before we took the cross. 
but when we return from our pilgrimage, or if, by chance, we desist from our pilgrimage, we shall stray to aid and show full justice regarding them. 53. We shall have the same respite, moreover, and in the same manner, in the matter of showing justice with regard to forests to be annulled and forests to remain, which Henry our father or Richard our brother constituted, and in the matter of wardships of lands which belong to the fee of another wardships of which kind we have hitherto enjoyed by reason of the fee which someone held from us in military service, and in the matter of abbeys founded in the fee of another than ourselves in which the lord of the fee may say that he has jurisdiction. And when we return, or if we desist from our pilgrimage, we shall straightway exhibit full justice to those complaining with regard to these matters. 54. No one shall be taken or imprisoned on account of the appeal of a woman concerning the death of another than her husband. 55. All fines imposed by us unjustly and contrary to the law of the land, and all amercements made unjustly and contrary to the law of the land, shall be altogether remitted, or it shall be done with regard to them according to the judgment of the twenty-five barons mentioned below as sureties for the peace, or according to the judgment of the majority of them together with the aforesaid Stephen Archbishop of Canterbury, if he can be present, and with others whom he may wish to associate with himself for this purpose. And if he cannot be present, the affair shall nevertheless proceed without him, in such way that, if one or more of the said twenty-five barons shall be concerned in a similar complaint, they shall be removed as to this particular decision, and, in their place, for this purpose alone, others shall be substituted who shall be chosen and sworn by the remainder of those twenty-five. 56. If we have deceased or dispossessed Welshmen of their lands or liberties or other things without legal judgment of their peers, in England or in Wales, they shall straightway be restored to them. And if a dispute shall arise concerning this, then action shall be taken upon it in the march through judgment of their peers concerning English holdings according to the law of England, concerning Welsh holdings according to the law of Wales, concerning holdings in the march according to the law of the march the Welch shall do likewise with regard to us and our subjects. 57. But with regard to all those things of which any one of the Welch by King Henry our father or King Richard our brother, deceased or dispossessed without legal judgment of his peers, which we have in our hand or which others hold, and for which we ought to give a guarantee, we shall have respite unto the common term for crusaders except with regard to those concerning which a plea was moved, or an inquest made by our order, before we took the cross. But when we return from our pilgrimage, or if, by chance, we desist from our pilgrimage, we shall straightway then show full justice regarding them, according to the laws of Wales and the aforesaid districts. 58. We shall straightway return the son of Llewellyn and all the Welch hostages, and the charters delivered to us as surety for the peace. 59. We shall act towards Alexander King of the Scots regarding the restoration of his sisters, and his hostages, and his liberties and his lawful right, as we shall act towards our other barons of England, unless it ought to be otherwise according to the charters which we hold from William, his father, the former King of the Scots and this shall be done through judgment of his peers in our court. 60. Moreover all the subjects of our realm, clergy as well as laity, shall, as far as pertains to them, observe, with regard to their vassals, all these aforesaid customs and liberties which we have decreed shall, as far as pertains to us, be observed in our realm with regard to our own. 61. Anasmic as, for the sake of God, and for the bettering of our realm, and for the more ready healing of the discord which is arisen between us and our barons, we have made all these aforesaid concessions, wishing them to enjoy forever entire and firm stability, we make and grant to them the folioing security, that the baron, namely, may elect at their plea or twenty-five barons from the realm, who ought, with all their strength, to observe, maintain and cause to be observed, the peace and privileges which we have granted to them and confirmed by this our present charter. In such wise, namely, that if we, or our justice, or our bailiffs, or any one of our servants shall have transgressed against anyone in any respect, or shall have broken one of the articles of peace or security, 
and our transgression shall have been shown to forbearance of the aforesaid twenty-five, those forbearance shall come to us, or, if we are abroad, to our justice, showing to us our error, and they shall ask us to cause that e our error are to be amended without delay. And if we do not amend that error, or, we being abroad, if our justice do not amend it within a term of forty days from the time when it was shown to us or, we being abroad, to our justice, the aforesaid forbearance shall refer the matter to the remainder of the twenty-five barons, and those twenty-five barons, with the whole land in common, shall distrain and oppress us in every way in their power, namely, by taking our castles, lands and possessions, and in every other way that they can, until amends shall have been made according to their judgment, saving the persons of ourselves, our queen and our children. And when amends shall have been made they shall be in accord with us as they had been previously. And whoever of the land wishes to do so, shall swear that in carrying out all the aforesaid measures he will obey the mandates of the aforesaid twenty-five barons, and that, with them, he will oppress us to the extent of his power. And, to anyone who wishes to do so, we publicly and freely give permission to swear, and we will never prevent anyone from swearing. Moreover, all those in the land who shall be unwilling, themselves and of their own accord, to swear to the twenty-five barons as to distraining and oppressing us with them, such ones we shall make to wear by our mandate, as has been said. And if any one of the twenty-five barons shall die, or leave the country, or in any other way be prevented from carrying out the aforesaid measures, the remainder of the aforesaid twenty-five barons shall choose another in his place, according to their judgment, who shall be sworn in the same way as the others. Moreover, in all things entrusted to those twenty-five barons to be carried out, if those twenty-five shall be present and chance to disagree among themselves with regard to some matter, or if some of them, having been summoned, shall be unwilling or unable to be present, that which the majority of those present shall decide or decree shall be considered binding and valid, just as if all the twenty-five had consented to it. And the aforesaid twenty-five shall swear that they will faithfully observe all the foregoing, and will ka e then be observed to the extent of their power. And we shall obtain nothing from any one, either through ourselves or through another, by which any of those concessions and liberties may be revoked or diminished. And if any such thing shall have been obtained, it shall be vain and invalid, and we shall never make use of it either through ourselves or through another. 62. And we have fully remitted to all, and pardoned, all the ill will, anger and rancor which have arisen between us and our subjects, clergy and laity from the time of the struggle. Moreover have fully remitted to all, clergy and laity, and as far as pertains to us have pardoned fully all the transgressions committed, on the occasion of that same struggle, from Easter of the sixteenth year of our reign until the re-establishment of peace. In witness of which, moreover, we have caused to be drawn up for them letters patent of Lord Stephen, Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Henry, Archbishop of Dublin, the aforesaid bishops and Master Pangelf, regarding that surety and the aforesaid concessions. 63. Wherefore we will and firmly decree that the English Church shall be free, and that the subjects of our realm shall have and hold all the aforesaid liberties, rights and concessions, duly and in peace, freely and quietly, fully and entirely, for themselves and their heirs from us and our heirs, in all matters and in all places, forever, as has been said. Moreover it has been sworn, on our part as well as on the part of the barons, that all these above-mentioned provisions shall observed with good faith and without evil intent, the witnesses being the above-mentioned and many others. Given through our hand, in the plain called Runnymede between Windsor and Stands, on the fifteenth day of June, in the seventeenth year of our reign. Roger of Wendover, the signing of Magna Carta at Runnymede, 1215. Rudyard Kipling poem, What Say the Reeds at Runnymede?